Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us uh, this morning, uh, those of you in the hall and those of you uh, who are at home. Still many people are at home. Before I be uh, begin the formal talk, I just want to report back to the Sangha that uh, I believe some of you know that uh, we've begun every, uh, every other Saturday morning to have a uh, morning, a work morning, uh, we call selfless service morning here at the center. And yesterday we had, I think, 30 or 40 people. It was quite wonderful. Uh, and uh, just a lot of good energy, a lot of happiness, uh, both in terms of uh, giving service uh, to the center to keep it uh, looking good and functioning, taking care of things, fixing things, uh, but well at, as people connecting with each other, which was most important. Uh, you know, we, we uh, could call it a work morning. It is because we are doing work, and there's obviously work needs to be done uh, to maintain our, our center. Uh, but we call it selfless service. That is to elevate it, that it is not just work, it's practice. Uh, in the Zen tradition, uh, work meditation is uh, ancient. It goes back to the beginnings of Zen. Uh, because again, the idea is just the same way we learn in the hall to live in the here and now and be present in the here and now. We need to learn how to work, walk, work <laughs> in the here and, and now. So one of the things we do is when we uh, are working, we are just very focused on doing what we're doing, one thing at a time. And so we're really cultivating the same mind uh, that we're cultivating in the hall. That's why it's called work meditation. Uh, but I think the reason we've also called it selfless service is to realize that, you know, part of our, the deepest part of our practice is to learn to become less selfish, less self-centered, uh, more selfless. That is our practice, to stop thinking so much of myself and, and, and thinking uh, more of others. So uh, one of the reasons we call it selfless service is uh, the service is done without self. What does that mean? With, without picking and choosing, liking and disliking. Uh, selfless service in a certain sense means uh, I do whatever needs to be done. Right? And for many of us, uh, that's, a, that's something we need to learn, you see. Because we, we sort of like to do some things and we don't like to do other things. <laughs> I'd like to do this job, but I really would not like to do this job. Or, uh, you know, I have better things to do on my Saturday morning uh, that I'd like to do. Uh, and again, it's not that that's bad, but it's, it's the, you know, our way is a way where we are learning to kind of diminish uh, our self-centeredness and learning to show up in the world. And, and, you know, in this case, we're learning within our community uh, to be of service, to be of help. How can I be of help? How can I be of service? How can I, uh, you know, participate in the taking care of? So, uh, so, you know, many people kind of have that attitude, uh, but many of us don't have that attitude. <laughs> it's, a, it's a back and forth. And so it becomes a practice, you see, because I feel these two tugs. Yeah, I'd really like to do da 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 but yet there's, you know, things to be done to take care of our center. You know, and we feel that, you see, we feel that tug. And that's a tug uh, that's really part of our practice because we feel that tug a lot in life, right? You know, it's like, do I do what's best for me? Do I say what I want to say? Do I do what I want to do? Do I always live for my likes and my preferences or do I learn to uh, let go? Right, and and enter the stream of of service. So uh, you know the selfless service mornings that we have here are really one aspect of I think a very central part of of, of our practice, which is learning to be less selfish and more selfless in our life. And again, as I've said many times, it's not a sacrifice. It's actually a freedom. Because many of us 
our self-centeredness, our self-absorption, our self-concern, even though we, we spend a lot of time <laughs> nurturing it, it's a burden. It's a closing off. It's a, it's a, it's a kind of a, a cocoon-like uh, thing that we, we don't even know that, it, you know, we, we feel it, but we don't know why we feel disconnected. Uh, and often it's because we haven't, we, we still have this boundary around self and identification with I, me, my. And so learning to be selfless uh, in all aspects of our life, in, in, in our relationships, is, uh, is very much uh, helpful. Uh, because it, it, it ends up actually feeling better. And we feel more open. Right? We, we feel happier. It's a strange thing. We think, you know, focusing on myself, taking care of my needs, and, and always, uh, you know, picking and choosing according to my likes and dislikes. That's the path to happiness, right? But it's actually, in Buddhism, considered, no, that's the path to unhappiness <laughs> in the long run. And actually uh, learning, to, uh, learning to, to make one's choices with different criteria uh, is is much healthier, and it's also obviously healthier uh, for the organism. You know, the planet, society, the community. You know, the more people feel, don't feel separate from, don't feel disconnected, but feel feel a part of. You know, one is a cell in something greater than just myself. It's, and it's also actually the way things really are. So I want to return to uh, Zen Keys. I started last week. I won't go into what I talked about last week, but I, uh, because I believe it's recorded. Uh, hopefully many of you uh, were, there, were here or have listened to it. And I did that because uh, Thich Nhat Hanh, we call him Thai, teacher, uh, turned 95 uh, two weeks ago. And uh, and so I wanted to honor him by going to a book that's not very widely known, uh, called Zen Keys. Uh, it, was, it was written in 1974. So as I said last week, it was kind of pre-discovery. <laughs> it, was, it was when uh, he was really much more uh, a Zen teacher in the Zen tradition, uh, obviously doing it his way, uh, but had not really entered a, the, the, the larger uh, you know, uh, stream of, uh, of well-knownness. And he had not become, you know, the, uh, what, the father of, mi of mindfulness and engaged Buddhism, you know. So uh, it gives an insight, I think, into, in, into what uh, nurtured him and really where he, he's been coming from, from for the last uh, uh, 50 years. Uh, as he's kind of entered the world stage and he's done so many wonderful different kinds of teachings uh, to help people uh, personally and in their relationships and learning how to love and you know, learning how to, to take their practice into daily life, it's often gotten lost or not even acknowledged uh, his deep roots in the Zen awakening tradition. Uh, and it's very personal for me, as I said last week, because I encountered him in the 70s, and this is the way he taught, and this is what he was, and also I was somewhat involved uh, with the first uh, publication of Zen Keys back in the 70s. So um, I read a little bit last week, and I just want to uh, continue just picking, sort of picking and choosing. <laughs> so I, I want to go back to the first page where he talks about uh, when he entered the monastery, he was 16, uh, and he was basically given a book, the Little Manual of Practice, which was all, which was actually, he said, written in Chinese characters, and in those days, very much part of the uh, Zen tradition, I guess, in Vietnam, was that the Zen monks learned Chinese, because many of the texts were still in Chinese. And it had three parts. Practice in everyday life, essential practices for a novice, and the teachings of Zen master Kwai Chan. And he says, there's no philosophy in this book at all. It was all very practical. The first part taught how to calm and concentrate the mind. The second discusses the precepts and the other practices essential to monastic life, sort of the ethical conduct. 
And the third is a beautiful exhortation to Zen students to encourage them to remember that their time and life are precious and should not be vainly dissipated. Uh, and he talks about, because he had had somewhat of an, I guess earlier, had somewhat of a Western education or had been exposed to Western ideas, you know, where you kind of, uh, you know, think a lot and you understand the ideas behind things. So he, he says that, uh, you know, being given something and told that, you know, he's got to memorize it, learn it by heart and practice it. And there was no explanation, which is very Zen. There was no explanation. It was sort of like, just do it. Uh, he did, he did, he said, he sounded like he had some resistance to and sort of questioned uh, some of the people. And uh, anyhow, he was basically told, uh, you know, this is the way we do it. If you're going to be a monk, you have to accept it. And out of this, I won't go into it, but I think many of you are familiar with, uh, and he's, what is it, what is it, what's it called? You know, the book of Gattas? The Sun, My Heart? Present moment, with present moment, wonderful moment. Again, one of his earlier uh, translated books, which, which was uh, many of these uh, gattas that he learned, as well as some modern ones. And the whole idea of gattas is, uh, it's very wonderful, because it's teaching us mindfulness, but also in a context. So it gives, it gives a little f flavor. It kind of gets us to pay attention to whatever we're doing, but it also gives us a bigger context. So, so what is an example? So he used the example, when I wash my hands, I bring forth this thought, water flows over these hands. May I use them skillfully to preserve our precious planet. You see? So you're taking something, an everyday experience, we wash our hands. The gata gets us to really be aware, oh, I'm washing my hands. I'm not doing, you know, this is the here and now. I'm not doing anything else. I'm here, I'm washing my hands right now. But yet it gives a little, you know, different flavor. May I use them skillfully to preserve our precious planet. So it, it ties in what would be, uh, a, you know, we might say a, a just a mundane, totally human, everybody does it experience into an exercise in mindfulness, but an exercise in really, well, selflessness, I guess. <laughs> where you look at these hands and you realize, you know, may I use these hands for the benefit of others? That's really what he's saying. So it reinforces this thought of, of awakening and being of service. And this is very important because uh, this shows that his dimension of mindfulness was much bigger than just present moment awareness that we also want to transform our thoughts. See, has anybody noticed that thoughts are arising all the time, you see? But most of our thoughts aren't really worth much of anything, are they? So if we're gonna, so part of the training is, if I'm gonna have thoughts, why don't I have, why don't I have right thought, good thoughts? Thoughts that are in alignment with my aspiration, with my intention. So this is part of this early training that he's, so he gives another example uh, that when he was sitting in the meditation hall, he was to think sitting here is like sitting under the Bodhi tree. The Bodhi tree is the tree that the Buddha came to enlightenment. My body is mindfulness itself, entirely free from distraction. So again, it's sort of like our opening got this, but it's a, it's a way of, we might say, talking to myself. In a, in, a, in a meaningful way and reminding me, oh, yeah, this is about waking up, right? Let me just be very focused on my purpose while I'm sitting here. And then he gives the example, like when even using the toilet, he was taught, he said to himself, defiled or immaculate, increasing or decreasing, these concepts only exist in our mind. The reality of interbeing is unsurpassed. So please, next time you use the toilet, please remember this one. You see, it's, it's very profound because usually we think of what we do in the toilet is, is something dirty, right? And why do we think it's dirty? Because we are thoughts. <laughs> we, you know. 
Have you ever noticed that an animal will go to the bathroom anywhere, does it? It doesn't consider it dirty, does it? But it's our, it's our discriminating mind. And again, it's not like, oh, okay, so now I can defecate wherever I want. I get it. No, this, this, is, this, is, this is not what this is about. But this is going to, to use this experience to kind of reify in the mind that all my concepts of clean and dirty, right and wrong, immaculate and defiled, are all just concepts. The reality of interbeing is unsurpassed. Everything is just arising according to causes and conditions. This is a totally natural experience. It's neither clean nor dirty, right? It's just part of the human condition. And so again, uh, so anyhow, and, and he ends a little chapter by saying, when I was 16, I thought the little manual was written for young people at the beginning of their practice. Today, more than 50 years later, when he wrote this, I know that the little manual is the very essence of Zen Buddhism. So this is the man who's written, I mean, what, over 100 books? <laughs> or maybe those are the number of books that have been translated into English. I mean, he's, right? He's a great intellect. He's a great philosopher. He's a great uh, you know, teacher of, of Buddhism. And yet he says, this little manual, which just teaches how to practice, which really how to live, is the essence of Zen. So this is very important, you know, that we take it from somebody who's written a hundred books, <laughs> and even we know, even if he doesn't write, he, people are still producing books in his name. So even even after his uh, his stroke, he still books are still coming out. He says, the essence of Zen is in this little manual, which is you know again how we live, our moment-to-moment -moment life, our relationships, how we show up in the world. And uh, so this is, again, one of the, uh, you know, really the gifts of Zen is this uh, practicality and simplicity. So as I said last week, uh, you know, they're, they're all short little pithy little writings and they're, and they're different sections. Uh, so this is a little section called the Buddhist Revolution. So I'm, I'm skipping around just to give you a flavor of it, because again, I'm, I guess I'm encouraging people at some point to maybe pick up Zen keys, um, because it is, a, again, it, it, it is different than um, most of what we're familiar with with Thai. And he's talking about now about Buddhism. Um, so Buddhism uh, comes. Uh, is a Sanskrit word that means to know and also to wake up. The one who knows, the one who wakes up, is a Buddha. He said the Chinese translated the word Buddha as an awakened person. And then he says in his own writing, and it's in italics, so this is Tai saying, Buddhism is therefore a doctrine of awakening a doctrine of insight and understanding. So this is very important, you know, to realize even though he is the father of mindfulness, he is the father of living in the present moment, he is, you know, the father of engaged Buddhism, right, in our current time. In his own words, Buddhism is a doctrine of awakening. An awakening, he says, a doctrine of insight and understanding. And again, I focused on that last week uh, where I read from sections where Thai is very clear, where he says, you know, the purpose of Zen Buddhism is to, you know, see into our, into our minds, to understand our true nature, to understand it, to experience, and to live it. This is the purpose. Uh, and so it, it gives us, you know, again, even those of us at the beginning where we're still just trying to, you know, get a little stability in our minds <laughs> and quiet this thing down or, or trying to get a little stability in our life or starting to calm our, our emotions, you know what I'm saying, and all that, or, or just learning basic kind of ethical living and, and how to relate uh, to people in life in a, in, a, in, a, in a way that has, has some integrity to it. 
So even though we may be practicing Dharma at that level, because that's what we need now, it's still good to know that this is where the path leads, right? You see? I mean, we may, we may be just starting up the mountain, right? And we're just dealing with uh, sore legs and sore back and you know, getting used to the elements and getting used to the shoes, right? You know, that may be, you know, where we're beginning and, and how we're dealing with it. But it's still good to know that this path goes somewhere, <laughs> right? It's not, it's not always going to be about, uh, you know, struggling and getting used to and managing. Right? At some point, it begins to elevate, and, and the views are different, and the experiences are different. Uh, and again, I think that's very important, uh, no matter where we are on this path. Right? And again, no matter where we are on the path, we're all on the path, which is a wonderful thing. But to know, oh, that this, you know, based on the Buddha's experience, his own living experience in his own life, he clearly says, this is a path of awakening, of knowing who you really are. Which, of course, means no longer identifying with what you're not, <laughs> which are all the kind of defiled, contaminated aspects of our mind and our experience. And, and we'll go into that. And then it's interesting, to uh, that he goes on to say, the rise of Buddhism in India must be considered a new vision of humanity and life. And I think that's interesting for us because um, I think it, even though he's talking about uh, 6th century BC India <laughs> when the Buddha taught, I think it's still relevant to today. Right? I mean, because he then goes on, uh, you know, he says it was a reaction against the Brahmanic practices and beliefs of his society at the time. And he goes on from an intellectual standpoint, uh, anyhow, the, the texts and the realization and philosophical standpoint of the time uh, and, the, uh, and the belief of the time and the social point of views of the time, like the caste system. I mean, from the intellectual standpoint, it, it rigorously rigorously rejected the notion of a self, capital S, which was the heart of Brahmanism. So, what, so, I mean, basically he's making a case that Buddhism, while it came out of the Vedic tradition of his time, it was, well, he calls it the Buddhist revolution. It was revolutionary that, in other words, as he says, it opens up a new vision of what it means to be a human being and what life's really about. And obviously he, he saw at his own time that the, all the strictures and the philosophies uh, of, of, uh, of Brahmanism at that time and the belief system and the gods, uh, you know, and the caste system and, and, and you know, there was a lot of ritual and, and sacrifices and I mean, the whole thing. He, he swept that all aside. And he offered uh, his, his, remember, who, who came to him? People of the Brahmanic culture that, that he had grown up in and that everybody else had grown up in. Mean, he, wasn't, he wasn't teaching uh, somebody else. He was teaching people of, you know, who were deeply steeped in, this, in, in the religion and the philosophy and the culture and the caste system and the whole thing of his time. Right then and there, he offered a totally different view a totally different practice. He rejected all of that. He rejected the idea of, uh, of deism. He rejected the idea, you know, that there were these uh, gods uh, who were controlling our life that had to be propitiated and sacrificed to. He rejected the whole idea that there were, you know, the most important thing was the, uh, you know, the scriptures and the holiness of the scriptures, right? I mean, he, I could go on and on, but I mean, to understand, he rejected all that and opened up you know, a, a vision of, of just an awakened human being who's totally free. And he saw all these kind of st strictures and structures as something that was basically preventing human beings from experiencing the truth of who and what they are, right? And their freedom. So, I mean, he, he, 
he did away with the priestly caste. You know, there's no intermediary. <laughs> Uh, you know, he did away with the caste system. His 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 sangha was open to anyone, even untouchables. Very controversial at the time. He took he took untouchables into, you know, he, you know he 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 uh, he ordained his uh, his stepmother uh, as a nun. Again, very revolutionary at the time. Uh, but most importantly, he said, you know, the path is just an inward path of realizing your true nature of coming home. And that it is open, therefore, to everyone, right? Uh, so again, I won't belabor it, but uh, uh, Thai, again, it's, it's interesting that he calls Buddhism in India a new vision of humanity. Uh, again, of course, he was obviously Indian. And then I might have read this last week, but again, it's just interesting. This is called Not Self. Uh, and he says, the Buddha used the notion of not-self to upset and destroy. Later, he used it to expound his teaching of awakening. It can thus be said that the notion of non-self is the point of departure for Buddhism. Buddhist scriptures often speak of the not-self natures of all phenomena. In order to understand not-self, the concept of impermanence in Buddhism must be considered. Everything is impermanent. Everything is in a state of perpetual change. Yeah, so we, we so this is not new to you. Uh, but again, we have to understand that at his time, the fundamental belief of his Vedic Brahmanistic culture was there was this Atman, this self with a capital S. There was this permanent entity thing. Uh, people also believed in a soul that kind of traveled from one lifetime to another, right? And the Buddha in his enlightenment said, no, there's nothing that is solid or permanent. Nothing. Everything is just created by causes and conditions. Everything is just made up of everything else. Everything is interconnected. Nothing is separate, you know? We, 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 we look at ourselves, we look at other people, and we think we're distinct objects, right? We even label, and we, and we just kind of create this one-dimensional experience of life and people, but that's not the way things really are, right? This body, if, if we could, you know, if all of a sudden I could be x-rayed or MRI'd or whatever it is we do these days, you'd see what? Endless parts. Endless parts, endless system, and some kind of, you know, magnificent, wondrous kind of self-regulating interaction that has nothing to do with me. <laughs> you will not find a Fred in any of that. You will not find a body in any of that. Right? You'll just find parts and, and subparts, all in process. And this body is created, was created by who? My, my parents, who created their body, their parents, you know, endless, endless stream of ancestors, all here, right? This, you know, it's made up, the body is made up of elements, right? <laughs> it's made up of water and, and minerals and earth, and, right, and air. There's nothing solid to any of this. It's all in process. You know, oh, but... Well, my mind, you know, my mind's a real thing. No, you can't. You look into your mind, you can't find anything. All you find is thoughts endlessly coming and going, endlessly changing, feeling states endlessly coming and going, right? There's nothing, nothing solid anywhere. The Buddha called that non-self. He said, nothing has a, a permanent self, right? This table was not created by another table. This table was created by bringing together of parts. This flower was not, it didn't come from a flower. It didn't just, it didn't just <laughs> come from that. It came from, anyhow, you understand. Yeah, and it's nurtured by so many things. This, this flower has no existence separate from water, from air, from light, and from all its nutrients, and from the earth that it sits in. It doesn't have a separate existence. Nothing has a separate existence. We're all part of everything else. It'd be wonderful if people understood they're all part of this world. 
this world, this planet is a living organism that's alive and changing. And that we, we, you know, we, we're, we're part of that. <laughs> you know, when you understand interbeing, and remember, Thich Nhat Hanh did not, if, I remember I told you last week that I had an earlier ver version, early translation of Zen Keys that was done in the 70s. And again, it was translated from the, the French. He, he wrote this book in French. Um, I forget what he called it, but he, he, he hadn't coined the word interbeing. I mean, that came later. I think that came in the 80s. I'm trying to remember uh, when, I, when he first announced that he had come up with this word, uh, interbeing. And it was for the order of interbeing. Uh, I thought it sounded a little Star Trekish in, in England. <laughs> <laughs> interbeing, you know, but uh, but it was really wonderful. He 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 was searching for a word that could talk about shunyata, emptiness, and non-selfness in a way that could be uh, felt, you know. And this idea that our being does not stand alone. In our beingness, everything is connected with everything else. So that's uh, that's that. And then uh, here's another one called The Vanity of Metaphysics. He says, and he's talking about everything that he's said so far. He says, these preliminary remarks are the point of departure of Zen Buddhism. If concepts, again, very strong, part of uh, what Zen is and uh, what's called uh, consciousness only, mind only uh, school, Yogacara, one of the great Buddhist philosophical schools. If concepts do not represent reality, then conceptual knowledge of reality can be considered erroneous. I say this to a people in a culture who live in concepts. Right? We, we are so deeply steeped in concept, in ideas, in beliefs, and uh, thinking they're true, that he says, uh, this is, you know, if concepts are only words, and they are just kind of representatives of reality, they are not reality. And he, and he quotes some from, from the Buddha. And, 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 and again, you know, uh, Indians are very metaphysical. They like metaphysical discussions. Uh, and, and so oftentimes in the sutras you see uh, somebody would come to him and ask him a philosophical question like uh, uh, the affinity of the world. Somebody asked him, you know, talk, can you talk about the affinity of the world, infinity of the world? And the Buddha said, whether the world is finite or infinite, limited or unlimited, the problem of your liberation remains the same. Okay, so whether we can, uh, you know, go on and on for hours and hours and talk about all the metaphysical uh, understandings, right, of life, what does it have to do with the existential question of why do I suffer and how do I free myself from my suffering? Right? And we see throughout the Buddha's teaching, he keeps coming back to that. Right? That's, what, that's his concern. And so it's not that concepts are bad, but conceptual knowledge, you know, this is one of my, <laughs> some of the bones I, I pick with many of my uh, Sangha students uh, who are very much into uh, brain science. And I, I don't have a bone to pick with brain science and, and all this wondrous uh, uh, scientific, uh, you know, research that is now uh, you know, basically, what, what are they showing? That mindfulness meditation, uh, you know, works <laughs> and has a scientific basis. They can watch, you know, they can take MRIs and they can hook up the mind and show what's, what all the things that are going on and that, you know, it's beneficial. You know, things that have been known for thousands of years or else, you know, they're, I mean, now there are whole schools of, I guess, physics or, I don't know, cognitive scientists that are saying, yeah, there is no basis in the mind for a, a self. 
You know, it's a self-regulating system. There is no self. So, I mean, I am, I am happy. Uh, so I say, and I think it's oftentimes uh, what used to be metaphysical speculation is now scientific speculation. All very interesting, but again, I would say the same thing. Is this ending your suffering, knowing this? That's all. And if it isn't, then maybe there's better, better things that you can be doing with your time. Uh, you know, and he, here's another famous one that, that he quotes uh, from anecdote from the time of the Buddha. Suppose a man is struck by a poison arrow and the doctor wishes to take out the arrow immediately. Suppose the man doesn't want the arrow removed immediately uh, until he, and again, in, in the actual anecdote, it's usually uh, more interesting because the person keeps wanting to pull the arrow out and the philosopher, uh, who's, who's a guy who was shot, uh, keeps saying things like, uh, hey, can you tell me who shot me? Right? And, uh, you know, how old was he? And can you tell me a little about his family and his parents? And I'm really interested, why did he shoot me? And, uh, and, and it goes on and on and on. And then, you know, in, 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 in the sutra, it goes on to, after he's just gone endlessly about the, uh, the person who shot the arrow, then he wants to know, well, tell me about the arrow. You know what I mean? Like, what kind of wood is it made out of? And the feather, what bird did that come from? And tell me about the bow. <laughs> and, uh, and then the Buddha says, what would have happened? If he were to wait until all his questions were answered, he might have died. Right? Right? If you have an arrow in, in you, you only have one concern. Anybody could possibly guess what that is? What? You get the arrow out. Right? So after you get the arrow out, then you can ask those speculative questions. And so, again, it's not that concepts are bad. It's like, what is the purpose of our practice? Our practice is to end our suffering. Our practice is learning how to be happy, learning to be whole, full human beings, right? peaceful minds, compassionate, loving, caring, right? patient. I mean, that's, that's, you know, awakening to our true nature. Right? And anything that supports that, that nurtures that, is beneficial. But I think there are many things that we do, it's not like they're harmful, you see. It's not like they're harmful. They're not like they're bad. But they just might not be helpful if our per. Again, it depends what our purpose is. Right? If our purpose is to be free, then, then only things that, that facilitate a growing freedom or an ending of suffering or an awakening of various kinds of wholesome uh, mind states within us. That's what our practice should be about. And this is uh, called the moment of awakening. To reach truth is not to accumulate knowledge, but to awaken to the heart of reality. Reality reveals itself complete and whole at the moment of awakening. In the light of awakening, nothing is added, nothing is lost. Emotions based on concepts no longer affect us. And then he refers to Bodhidharma that he had talked about. Bodhidharma is the uh, purported uh, Indian master who, who, came to, uh, who came to China and had uh, disciples and from that lineage Zen eventually emerged. He said, if Bodhidharma is an ideal person, it is because he has broken the chains of illusion that bind us to the world of concepts. The hammer used to break these chains is the practice of Zen. What is the practice of Zen? Well, all the things that we have talked about, right? All the things that he talked about earlier. When he talked about, you know, getting that little manual, learning how to stabilize, quiet, calm, the mind. Right? Learning to have an ethical context to the actions of our body, speech, and mind. You know, learning and reflecting on the preciousness of this life and this opportunity I've been given. And then, you know, awakening to all the inherent wholesomeness 
of our mind, but most importantly, you know, seeing through the illusion of self and the identification with self. I mean, and understanding, and it's not that difficult, understanding that, you know, it's like in Zen we say, you know, all thoughts arise from the mind. Where does this, where does this mind arise from? What is it all, you know? We sit in meditation and what do we see? Endlessly, thoughts arising and rising, disappearing. Well, where do they come from? You see, they must come from somewhere. But what is that place within our own minds that is pre-thought? You see, we, there, there's a knowing before we put it into words, right? You know something tastes good to you before you say, oh, this tastes good, right? Right? You know you're eating Thai food before you say, oh, are we eating Thai food? You kind of know it. There's a knowing. And that just goes on and on. You know whether you're happy. You know whether you're sad. Because you know, because this is your direct experience. So Zen helps us return to our direct experience of life and get out of this endless conceptualization uh, that unfortunately many of us are uh, stuck in. It's about freedom. And, and I'll just read a little more, then we'll stop and I'll take some questions. It's all good. One of the greatest potentialities of skillful means is to free beings from their prisons of knowledge and prejudice. We are often attached to our knowledge, our habits, our prejudices, and the language of Zen must be capable of liberating us from them. According to Buddhism, knowledge is the, is the greatest obstacle to awakening. Now, why is that? I mean, that sounds so contradictory, especially since the Buddhist tradition is full of knowledge. <laughs> and he goes on to say, it's because we're trapped by our knowledge. What is this knowledge we have? It's not just like knowledge of Buddhism. It's all the knowledge we think. I think I know this. Knowledge is about knowing. I think I know this. I think I know this about you. I think I know what's right for the world. I think I know what's right for everybody in the world. I think I know what's right for everybody in my family, don't I? Knowledge. It's not just having an idea, it's being attached to it and thinking it's right. He says, if we're trapped by our knowledge, we will not have the possibility of going beyond it and realizing awakening. When we believe something to be absolute truth and cling to it, we cannot be open to new ideas. Even if truth is knocking at the door, we will not let it in. The Zen student should strive to be free of attachments to knowledge and be open so that truth can enter. Very powerful thing. It's a good you know, how open am I? How open am I? How open am I to the ideas of others? How open am I to the experience of others? How much credence do I give, you know, to the views, the ideas, the experience of other human beings? Or, or do I truly believe my way is the right way? If we, if we believe my way is the tri right way, then I'm saying, you know, I have absolute truth. But there is no absolute truth. You can't find it. It's just made up. You know? I mean, many people will, who think they have absolute truth, and you say, well, how do you know you have absolute, absolute truth? And they'll what? They'll take out a book. You know, it says it right here, that this is absolute truth. But that's just a book. Those are just words, right? 
if absolute truth is, is absolute truth, then it must be able to be experienced by everyone. Right? I mean, this is, this is sort of the revolutionary thing about uh, Buddhism, uh, because when the Buddha had his, his great awakening experience and said, no, I'm paraphrasing. Oh my God. <laughs> You know, oh my God, this mind of mine that I thought was all these thoughts and feelings and ideas is not like that at all. It's open and spacious. There's no past, there's no future, there's no time. There's, it's, and it is the source of all goodness. Who would have ever believed that no matter what I've done, no matter what characteristics have, have, have contaminated this mind. In essence, it is as pure as ever. Who, who, you know what I'm saying? Who would have believed that? So, and then he went on in his teaching to go, you know, everybody can have the same experience. Don't, he, he would say, don't, don't believe it because I said it, right? Whether you love me, respect me, you know, blah, blah, blah. He said, don't. Experience it yourself. You see. If it's true, it can be experienced. If it's if it's not true, if it's just an idea, if it's just a concept, then then you know there's an attached. You know we, we're we're believing in knowledge. We're believing in ideas. And of course, you know I've said it before, but I mean this is this is this worsening predicament we're finding ourselves in our society in the world. The more and more I hear it, it, it's, it's, it's happening in families, right? That people believe their ideas are truth. And if, I, if I'm true, then you must be false. And the more I believe I'm true, the more I believe that you're false. The more I believe I'm right, the more I believe you're wrong. And while that might say, okay, but around that comes emotionality, right? comes anger. I'm angry at all these people who don't see the truth that's so obvious to me. See, I'm angry at them. And so we get anger, and then we get fear, and then we get despair, and people despair because I have the truth, right? And nobody's seen it, right? You know, I mean, I mean what just happened in, um, you know, you know the uh, you know the thing where they you know, you know took over the capital right they believed they had the truth which was what right that, that trump won the election and and that's the truth right and because nobody's acknowledging it <laughs> you know what i'm saying they're what they get angry but there's also up the side under, underneath that i think also with despair you know i see the truth What's, what's wrong with all these people, right? So that, and you know, that is a very you know, dangerous combination, attachment to views and, uh, and the emotionality that comes from that. So we, you know, everybody has to be very careful because again, it's beginning to divide families, you know, relationships. Uh, so, uh, so this is not just uh, Zen Buddhism. Right? This is this is something very real, and uh, this fundamental teaching. I mean, if people only had this fundamental teaching, you know, don't be attached to your ideas and views. They're just ideas and views, and they're always changing. Right? I mean, we, we as individuals know we have views today that we didn't have 10, 20, 30, 40 years ago. And society's views keep changing. Society's truths keep changing, right? I mean, there used to be people thought, uh, you know, having slaves was, was normal, right? Right? That was the truth, of course. You know, and people actually believed it was biblical. I mean, for those of you who are younger, you may not remember, but people thought it was biblical. You know, the Bible acknowledges that. Right? See, there were slaves in the Bible. And, you know. So, I mean, this is, there's nothing wrong with it. Yeah, so. Anyhow.
This is, this is in a chapter that Thai calls, if you meet the Buddha, kill him, which is from a, a famous koan, which was you know, very extreme, very inflammatory when you hear it. Uh, but again, it's very Zen, which is, you know, we can't even be attached to the Buddha, the concept of the Buddha. Right? I mean, there are stories in, uh, in uh, at least in, in Chinese uh, Buddhist history, where uh, you know, I mean, you know, for for um, you know most Asian Buddhists, you know, the the Buddha images, the Bodhisattva images on the altar are the most sacred things, right? And yet we find that uh, there were these great masters at time where there was great famine, you know, or things like that, uh, that they would uh, melt them down if they had gold in them, you know, so they could get the, so they could feed people, you know, with it. You know, Buddha, Buddha image has a statue, we invest a lot of meaning in it, and yet, at the end of the day, it's just a statue, right? Then I think I, I might have read these last week, but uh, just bear with me and then we'll, we'll open to questions. And this is at the end, his final chapter, which is called The Regeneration of Humanity. So Thich Nhat Hanh is a big, big, big thinker. <laughs> He's a big mind. He was, wasn't concerned with, uh, you know, simplicity of individuals. He was also had the bigger picture of humanity, of the world. I was talking to somebody yesterday and said, you know, I remember back in the, in the 60s, Thai was, he founded an organization. Was, he was concerned about climate change. I mean, back then, he was, con he was very concerned about uh, what human beings were doing to the earth, right? Mother Earth. So this is in his chapter on regeneration of humanity. And this is reading him. The point of departure for a new civilization. So he's, you know, big thinker, new civilization must be our determination not to be colonized by material goods or to contribute to the system of producing and consuming. You know, many of us, we are so, uh, especially in the West, you know, we have been involved since the Industrial Revolution, so involved with the center of life being producing and consuming, uh, we, don't, we don't know that. But I think for Thai, who came from Vietnam and had grown up in village life, you know, sort of pre-industrial, I think entering a culture uh, totally based on producing and consuming goods, uh, you know, he could see kind of with, with a more of a critical eye, more objectively than those of us in the midst of it. But uh, he does acknowledge in here that actually what's going on is in the midst of this uh, society that is based on uh, producing and consuming uh, is the basis for this new uh, civilization. And again, he doesn't say that these things are bad. He said we cannot be colonized. Colonized is a very interesting word since he came from a country that was a colony uh, of the French or whatever. You know, when colonize means that something outside is taking over you, right? You're being colonized, you're being taken over. We don't want to be colonized by the system of producing and consuming. The struggle against the treadmill of producing and consuming and for the recovery of human nature must be regarded as the avant-garde of our generation. And then he says, many people who live in abundance have revolted against materialism for, and then he puts in italics, for the need to be a human being. Very simple. We are human beings. We are not just producers and consumers of goods, of information. So the need to be a human being, this is not a new view. It is one of the fundamental human needs, stifled by super, superficial accumulation, 
This need to be a human being is our greatest hope. The element that can give birth to a new civilization. Very powerful. And then last but not least, it's along the same lines. I just think it's, I find it very inspiring myself. Technological, this is his last paragraph of this chapter. Technological civilization, and this is written back in the 70s, so we all certainly know uh, he doesn't really, uh, he didn't even, you know, <laughs> what he was talking about then in technological uh, civilization. I mean, if he was only, well, he's around now, but you know, what's happened in the last 50 years with the explosion of technology. Technological civilization continually creates new needs of consumption, most of which are not important. The civilization has also created great, great suffering and tragedies. Religions must be conscious of our need to awaken to our true humanity. Churches must work to rebuild communities in which a sane and healthy life can be lived, realizing that true happiness does not rest in consumption of goods paid for by the suffering, famine, and death, but in a life enlightened by the insight into interbeing and the recognition of our deep responsibility to be true to ourselves and to help our neighbors. So, I mean, if there was any uh, paragraph which sort of, for me at least, underlies, uh, you know, wanting to build a community like the, follow, uh, the you know, the, the Florida Community of Mindfulness and the teachings we give, you know, is to contribute to this, uh, you know, giving human beings a different sense of what it means to be a human being and giving them the, the means and the ability and the practices and the and the concepts that help them uh, do that. So we can learn how to be, he calls it our deep responsibility. This is strong, our deep responsibility to be true to ourselves. That means our true self, our best self, and to help our neighbors. So I will end there. We do have a few minutes. Any, any questions about any of this that I've said? Uh, Pete, anybody in the hall wants to ask a question, please uh, put your hands together and you'll be acknowledged. Anybody online? Ray Lynn is uh, up there. Any questions about what this means, how to live it, and the reality of our life? Yes, I can always count on you, Max. Somebody's got to do it, and Max jumps right in. There's the advantage of being young. And, and speak up because it gets a little muffled with the. Right. Um, yeah, I think that talk was very resonant. For me, not only the producing and consuming aspect, Mm -hmm. But, you know, recently I started working, started working, working, you know, for money and in the world and just seeing both within myself and with others, just the drive to just always be productive and always be working and how that, I mean, and I've seen it in myself can lead to kind of a rejection of you know, humanity and relationships and things like that. Uh, yeah, obviously, want to do one's best to do your best job and be mm -hmm. selfless, but <laughs> at certain points, like, wow, this is crazy. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, yeah, I think that's what Ty's talking about. You know, how do you find a balance? Uh, Obviously, uh, Thich Nhat Hanh is on the other extreme. His whole life was about being, and yet look at all he accomplished. I mean, it's incredible I mean, what one man accomplished, what one man established. But it all comes from what? The way he was. Right? I mean, he, I mean, all his writings, all his teachings, you know, going around the world and all his effects are all coming from what? His mind. It's not coming from anywhere else. And, and what, is, what, what is it that created this mind? 
that was so able to see clearly what was going on in society and so clearly come up with skillful you know, solutions you know, was everything he writes about in Zen Ki. He, he, was, he was awake. He was clear. And he understood you know, that the essence of being a human being is about being a human being. He got that. And the, and, and the less, we, less we were in touch with our being and the more we became doers, which is what he's calling you know, producers and consumers, you know, the less we're in touch with our, with our basic humanity. So, yeah, so I mean, you know, as lay people, we need to find that balance. You know, on the one hand, we see so many lay people, not necessarily in the Buddhist community, but, you know, just totally driven by producing and consumers. That's all their life's about. More, 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 more. Right? It's an endless treadmill. You know, and then there could be like, you know, the renunciate response, you know, which is, I'm, I'm out of here, right? Which is to, to, be, to be a monastic, right? You just, you just kind of reject the whole thing. But we're in the middle. We're lay people. So it takes a little more skill and finesse and I think a little more mindful awareness, right? Like you say, you know, you're, you're young, you, you want to perhaps, you know, have a career and have a family, you know, do all those things. And yet you, you see, you, you don't want to be consumed by it. You don't want that to be, you know, you don't want to lose your humanity just, just to, you know, to get ahead in your career and to make money and because but well, then you'll have to come here, you know, 50 years from now. <laughs> so get it, get it while you're young. Yeah, and find that balance. That's our challenge. Thank you, Max. Other, other uh, questions? Yes, Ray Lynn. If the statues in the hall are works of art, then why bow to them? Well, because, uh, every, yeah, so the question is, their work, well, works of art mean they were created by human beings. But you know, uh, it's interesting. In the, in, the, uh, in the history of Buddhism, uh, you know, 2,600 years ago, there was a living Buddha. Everybody had a living Buddha, a living awakened person, right? And then for several generations afterwards, he was still a living presence because there were people around who had been his students and disciples, right? So uh, they, could, they could share the living experience of, of being with him. But over time, over generations, you know, that begins to dis dissipate. So what, what you find in, in earliest Buddhism, you didn't find representations of Buddha. What you found were, if you like go to Bodh Gaya, you will see these footprints <laughs> with lotuses. You know, sort of, these were the representations. Or like the Dharma wheel, you know, the eight-spoke the eight wheel of the Dharma. That be, th those, it was symbols that were actually the representations of the Dharma, right? And of the Buddha's Dharma. But then over time, you know, Buddhism spread, and it didn't only spread east into Asia from India, it also spread west. So uh, actually, uh, there were Buddhist kingdoms all the way through now what is uh, Afghanistan and Iran. And they came in those areas, they came in contact with something that was coming from the West, which was the Greco-Roman tradition. And if anybody's ever been to a museum and go into the Greece or Roman section, what do you see? Lots of physical representations of their gods. And if you're interested, some of the earliest physical representations of the Buddha happened in what's called the Gandhara, um, the Gandhara culture, which I think was somewhere in Afghanistan, Iranian, but it was a Greco. And you'll see Buddhas, and guess what? They have long flowing hair, they have mustaches, you know, and they're sort of wearing Greek-like clothes. So those, so the actual physical representations of the Buddha really came from the Greco-Roman and the encounter with, with the Indian culture. And then obviously it became part of Buddhism and it spread. Um, why do it today? Because, you know, I mean, we could have uh, nothing on the altar. 
we could have a flower on the altar. But having uh, a representation of the Buddha, for me, uh, does a couple of things. It means that even though we are here uh, in 2021 in Tampa, Florida, uh, what we are practicing, what we are teaching, has deep roots in human history and human experience, right? It's not just something that we made up, right? That, that this is part of a great wisdom tradition of human experience. And by having the Buddha up there, representation of the, both the historical Buddha, but also a Buddha means, as we learned today, a Buddha means an awakened one. So a Buddha is really an image of, of, that reminds us of the potential of all, all of us to be awakening of the Buddha's teachings. And again, I just think as human beings, we are human beings, we have senses. We see, we hear, we smell, we touch. So seeing a beautiful representation has meaning to us. Right? Has meaning to us. And so therefore, you know, it, it's up there to help us. You know, when we come in, uh, when, when, when we come in the meditation or we see a Buddha, we stop, we bow. What is that? To acknowledge. I'm entering, you know, a sacred space. I'm entering a space that's about, that's about dedicated to purifying the mind, about awakening. Right? So that's, I mean, that's why it's up here. It's not just up here to pray to, right? the, you know, the, because it's just, it's just a statue. But of course, on the other hand, uh, if, you're, if you use it as something to pray to because you know it's a, just a representative of something which is uh, you know, beyond this image, then that can be helpful too. Right? So, uh, so that's just an, that's, that's, that's a reason. You know, I think I think I I, I might have said it because we have a, a Zen Chan intensive going on. I think somebody asked me the same question. You know, so uh, you know there is this interchange, something just like that. So somebody says to the Zen master, I think he's a Chan master in China. You know, because he's prostrating, he's bowing, and the guy says, "Hold on a second. <laughs> Isn't this Zen Buddhism, you know what I mean, which is beyond all concepts, all beyond all these things, and, you know, you know, and, and the Buddha, and the Master said, you know, if you meet the Buddha on the road, kill him and all that. He said, what, what are you doing, uh, you know, bowing to the Buddha, prostrating to the Buddha? And, and then the Master said to him very, very kindly, you know, if you, if you want to do whatever you want to do, that's fine. I prefer to prostrate. That has more meaning to me. I think that was a good answer. I, I, for me, I, I, I choose to pay respect because I have great respect for the Buddha and the tradition. But if you don't, that's fine. I mean, like in our hall, I mean, we don't monitor people whether they come in and bow, do we? No. Right? If people want to bow, we let them bow. That's, that's kind of our, our practice here. But if people don't want to, that's fine. Right? It's all good. So thank you, everyone. Uh